So good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Return to Rhyme Time webinar brought to you by Askell and Libraries Connected. And we are thrilled to have over 300 people from around the country joining us today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please keep your microphone on mute throughout the presentations. Um, there will be a panel discussion following the presentations. And if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll be delighted to answer the questions after the presentations. The webinar will be filmed and shared on YouTube. So if you don't wish to be filmed, please put your camera off. We're joined today um, helping me with this webinar by Sarah Mears, the Programme Manager for Libraries Connected, and Sue Ball from Staffordshire Libraries, along with those um, very, very kind librarians um, who will be telling us all about their experiences and they will be introduced to you later. My name's Chris Myhill and I'm Chair of ASCL, the Association of Senior Children and Education Librarians. And ASCL works closely in partnership with Libraries Connected to develop and support library services for children and young people. We work with all of the national organisations, so Book Trust, Literacy Trust, the Reading Agency, to ensure that there is a strong voice for the child throughout all of the national programmes. The past 18 months have had a very serious impact on library services for children and young people. And one of the things that has been missed most by both library users and library staff is rhyme time. Rhyme time brings huge joy, but it also plays a fantastic role in early speech and language development and in encouraging that parent and child bond, which as we know is so important. Now that rhyme times can restart, we will hear from those library services who have dipped their toe in the waters and restarted their rhyme times. And we'll find out from them what they've learned, what challenges they've faced along the way, and how they can help us restart our own services. There's so much to learn from each other. And that is the real strength of us coming together as a <coughs> library community to learn from each other and build together. Setting. We're delighted as well today to be joined by Liz Hodgman, who is Programme Manager at the Local Government Association. And Liz is going to talk to us about the positive impact of early years experiences and how that can have a massive impact on children. So thank you, Liz, for joining us and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. So um, I work for the Local Government Association um, and up until um, COVID and the first lockdowns, um, I was managing peer review. So we were working with local authorities um, and we were delighted to have a few librarians um, as peers. And we were going out um, and looking at the impact of speech and language in certain councils and how we could improve that. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today. We've moved over to doing different support um, during COVID. Um, so I want to just share some of what we've been doing. So I'm just getting my slides up. Hopefully you can see those. <clears throat> so why does speech and language matter? Um, it has lots of impact for children um, as they go forward into adulthood. Um, so for the, the scholar's hat, um, educational attainment is hugely impacted by speech and language. So the number of words a child has on school entry is predictive of the number of GCSEs a child will attain. One in four children who struggled with language at the age of five did not reach the expected standard in English at the end of primary school, compared with one child in 25 who had a good language skills at age five. 15% of pupils with identified speech and language and communication needs achieve the expected standard in reading, writing and mathematics at the end of their primary school years, compared with 61% of all pupils. Only 20% of pupils with speech and language and communication needs gained a grade four, or what we would know as a C or better, in English or maths at GCSE, compared with 64% of all pupils. It has an impact emotionally for children 81% of children with emotional and behaviour disorders have unidentified language needs. Mental health. Children with vocabulary difficulties at age five 
are three times as likely to have mental health problems in adulthood. Impacts on life chances, jobs. Children with poor vocabulary skills at age five are twice as likely to be unemployed when they reach adulthood. The handcuffs represent crime. 60% of young offenders have low language skills. Um, and we found that when we were doing the peer challenges, there were some areas that recruited um, speech and language therapists into their youth hey, offender Mary? teams to address, in the bedroom. to address some of those issues. Um, because Hello? these young offenders were going to become parents of the Yeah, future. mommy's in the other bed. <laughs> um, social disadvantage and poverty, the plate. Um, children with poor vocabulary skills at age five are at greater risk of poverty and social disadvantage. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide, but I think it's always good to go back and look at it and, and remind ourselves. So this shows human brain development. Um, and the neural connections for the, for the different functions as they develop. Um, and as you can see, the first um, um, neurons that develop are for the sensory pathways, the vision and hearing. And these develop from um, pre-birth um, and peak fairly early on. So children's sensory pathways peak early. But next that peaks early is language. So there's a real opportunity from just before birth, right the way through to about 11 months and then it starts declining. So that is the real key time that we need to support children with their early language development. So rhyme time with, with very young children is really, really key. The higher cognitive function there, which, which comes in later, um, yes. includes attention, abstract thinking and problem solving, memory, self-image um, and social interaction. So this graph really does show that the period from birth to one year is the most crucial in, in, in language development. I'm sure many of you have seen this. It's the pyramid of how children learn to speak um, and how they learn and develop their language skills. But I think it's always worth going back and, and looking at it. So at the very bottom, we have attention and listening. So this is when babies and toddlers turn towards the sound that they hear might be startled by a loud noise. They watch the face when someone's talking to them and they make sounds themselves. And as they move up, they start play and interaction um, and they start um, looking at who's speaking to them when their name is called. They start interacting and making noises to get attention themselves. And then gradually as they go through the stages, they start understanding language. So you can give a very tiny child a very basic instruction um, and they will be able to understand it even before they're able to verbalize um, and say words themselves. And then very shortly after they start actually using language and then they move into developing proper speech and sounds and learning grammar. Um, if you haven't done any work on the stages of language and you'd like to do some, I can, and I've put the link on the slide, um, have um, some really good breakdown of the ages and stages that children develop all the different skills and what's involved in those areas. Um, just one word of caution, um, every child develops differently, as you know, they're each unique. Um, so when you are working with children, if they're not always in the expected area, it may be they've got developed skills in other areas stronger and quicker, um, and these will catch up. So what's COVID done um, to speech and language? Um, we know that it's had a huge impact, and I'm sure over the coming next couple of years, we're going to see that in the, in the data that's produced for the Early Years Foundation stage. Um, the government have put in huge amounts of money for interventions into primary school, and particularly into reception years, because they know that children are starting school now with an even, even lower um, baseline than they had before for speech and language development. So I think it's important to look at why um, COVID's had such an impact. Face masks is one thing. Um, it's very difficult to see how people, um, expression, sorry. <coughs> um, expressions on people's faces. We can't see people smiling um, and the other expressions that they use their mouth for. Um, it's also harder to hear proper language. And when children are learning to speak, they often look at people's faces and watch the lip patterns. So masks do have a big impact um, and it can mask the letters P and T. So children may struggle more with phonics if people are wearing masks. 
experiences outside the home these have been dramatically reduced with the lockdowns um, with places being shut and families not being able to access them so whereas children would have visited libraries and parks soft play areas farms and shops and heard lots of new language um, and lots of experiences that the language comes with um, that's stopped um, and for many that's not restarted and that's having a huge impact Parental well-being, the emotional well-being of parents, um, research has shown over the years, this has a huge impact on children, but especially their speech and language. Um, if you if ever want to look at um, a, a short clip, there's a still face video um, that you can look at online and that shows when a parent isn't interacting with a child, the impact it has on that child. So we know parental well-being will impact on a child's development of speech and language. During lockdown, parents have had so many more issues to deal with. These could be financial, they might have been furloughed and earning less money. We know that people have had health issues, they may themselves have had COVID or close family. Housing and the worry for some people have been made homeless. Additional care responsibilities, maybe looking after a neighbour or relative. Social isolation, not being able to go to groups and meet other parents. I can't even hear them. Domestic abuse has increased, um, we've seen that in data, and there's been an increase in um, undiagnosed postnatal depression because families aren't accessing groups where there might have been early identification. Parents also might have experienced bereavement and unable to um, celebrate the life of the person that's died um, in the normal way of a funeral because they've been unable to access that. And schooling will also, also have an effect um, it's very difficult to juggle having children while you're trying to work and we know that has an impact um, and working from home um, all of these all increase um, huge levels of anxiety for parents there's also been a reduction in contact with extended family um, especially for um, new families um, had first time babies not having a, a mum around to support them uh, that was changed in future lockdowns where they could bubble in the first lockdown there was no support and that's had a huge impact um, on children and families there's been a massive reduction in the time a lot of children have spent in early education during the first lockdown um, only key worker children were allowed to attend um, but even though it's open now for all we're still seeing um, a reduction in the number of um, two, three and four year olds who are accessing their funded places. Plus, we're not seeing all families that work returning their children to childcare because they are working from home. The impact of working at home, as we said before, is very difficult to be on a Zoom call and have a young child. Um, often they're put in front of screens or televisions to try and keep them quiet while parents are working. Trying to get that balance is very, very difficult and parents are doing the best they can, but it does have an impact. Um, a reduction in peer interactions. If children aren't going out and about and they're not in childcare and there aren't toddler groups and rhyme times, they've not had that interaction with other peers um, around them. And all of this has meant there's been a huge reduction in the vocabulary these children are experiencing. They're experiencing far less words than they would normally have done. And this will impact their language development. So we will have more children starting school who have a low language um, ability. So I'm sure you've all heard the expression on numerous occasions, it takes a village to raise a child. During lockdown, I felt that the village was missing because we were locked down and parents were the only contact for their child and the village wasn't there for them. So now the village is even more important than it's ever been. Um, and we, we need the village to taking responsibility for the children uh, and their future development. So what needs to happen? We need to provide opportunities for children to hear new words. So as many opportunities as they can to mix um, with other people so they can experience new words and new language and increase their vocabulary. We need to provide opportunities for children to engage with peers and other trusted adults so they can broaden um, their relationships um, and attachments and provide opportunities for play. So we go back to the pyramid and that second part where they need to interact and play. So we need to provide lots more opportunities for play because these have been limited to home. 
and we need to provide access to stories and books because that is a great way of increasing children's vocabulary um, and understanding of stories and, and, and all the things that go with book learning. Um, we know that still there's lots of families that don't have books in their home or don't share books um, with their children. We need to provide a safe place for parents who've got young children to meet. Um, there are still parents who have high levels of anxiety about going out into the community. So we need to provide spaces where they feel comfortable and safe and, and that they, they feel reassured. And whilst we can't all be counsellors or family support workers or know everything that's going on and that a parent might need to access, just listening sometime to a parent and their needs and their concerns and validating them that they are real, um, I think reduces that stress on a parent once they've shared, we all know a problem shared is a problem halved. But then also knowing where you can signpost a family to. So knowing whether your children's centre is open and what services they've got. Um, so you can just signpost them either back to the council or children's centre or a local community group so that they can get the support they need. Because if they're better supported and able, then they will be better able to support their child and their language development. Um, that's it from me, um, but I'm very interested to hear um, what the libraries are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. I, I think that was really, really interesting. And uh, those statistics were really, really powerful. In fact, just a couple of points to note in the chat. Somebody has asked, is it possible to have a copy of your presentation? And, um, and also those statistics as part of that, um, because really, really important. Just to say that we are recording this as well, so people will have access to, um, to a recording. Um, well, it's my pleasure now to introduce to you four speakers uh, from three library services who have reintroduced Rhyme Time. And they are going to describe how they've achieved this and talk about some of the challenges that they faced and the solutions to those challenges. Um, so we have Beth from Norfolk. We've got Andrew and Angela from Blackburn with Darwin and Louise from Cambridgeshire. And um, we can start with Beth, who is going to give her presentation first of all. So over to you, Beth. Right, hopefully that shows okay. Yes, good. Um, so I want to, so my name is Beth Southard and I am the Community Librarian for Early Years uh, for Norfolk Library and Information Service. And what I want to do today is start by talking through the practicalities of restarting Bouncing Rhyme Time. Um, we noticed, uh, started to notice a decline in online engagement with our Bouncing Rhyme and Story Times around March or April, about the same time that families began to visit each other in person and community groups started to meet in person as well. And at that time, we started looking at the opportunities and options for returning to an in-person service in libraries. We knew to do so that we would need to keep numbers low and also we need to focus heavily on safety, particularly distancing. So the last week of May this year, we tested our initial system with a couple of pilot libraries. We used um, hoops in order to keep families distance two meters apart. We kept numbers to a maximum of five families, which a family was uh, defined as one adult and two children. We at the time didn't allow any book browsing and we put in place a booking system um, through an, a phone number, which allowed us to keep track of numbers and also have an easy contact list in case we needed to report anything. Yeah, sorry, I've got a toddler in my lap here. <laughs> um, adults, except for the session leader, had to remain masked. Um, throughout the group, though the ses some session leaders did keep masks as well. After successful pilots, we launched the offer countywide on the 7th of June, with 14 of our libraries offering 21 sessions a week. Week one, we had 56 families book on, um, and over the next month, we slowly scaled up, adding a couple libraries every week. Um, I kept an eye on the booking numbers and would get in touch with library branches um, when we noticed that they were getting fully booked up regularly or they would have full wait lists. 
and we would try to see if there were um, ways we could either expand capacity at the session or offer a second session in the week to allow more families to attend. Um, by the 19th of July, we were up to 36 sessions in 25 of our libraries and had 140 families um, booking in every week, which we were really, really happy with. And at this point was when we were able to relax some of our rules. Um, so the hoops were and still are used, but we stopped purchasing additional hoops. So now if sessions expand their numbers or new libraries offer groups, we still encourage them to use ways to distance families. This might be board books left on the floor um, to mark out where spots are, which does help with book issues as well, or maybe using a bit of tape to mark out a spot. Um, while there's no cap on attendance anymore, any increase in numbers for session attendance must be discussed between the staff who are running the group, the branch manager and the locality manager to make sure that it is kept in line with what's reasonable safety. Masks are still encouraged, but we don't enforce their use um, in the session. Uh, it varies very much library to library how much customers are wearing these um, and it's definitely something we've seen on the decline lately um, though we do find a lot of people are wearing the masks when they enter the building they just take them off for the session and then put them on again after um, which makes sense with the presentation and it helps with the communication I think plus a half hour of singing with a mask on is quite steamy um, I do say the hoops are not a perfect option particularly with more mobile children um, we often get babies who are chewing on the hoops or lifting them uh, and older toddlers and preschoolers might want to pick them up or carry them about. Uh, but it's been really useful reminder for adults on kind of the distancing and they do, do their best to kind of keep children in a reason away from others if possible. Uh, I want to say quickly about our booking system. Um, we have a phone um, team who do the bookings. Uh, and initially we weren't sure of demand, so we had a system of people could book one session a month um, in total because some places were only offering three spaces a week and we were worried that we would be limiting others ability to get to the group. After the first two weeks, though, we noticed people weren't booking far in advance and we weren't at full capacity in most libraries, so we switched instead. Every Thursday I put a post on Facebook that says booking is now open list all the sessions that are available um, and then people can book unlimited amounts every week um, or every month so that's worked really well and customers have been really good about the change to the system and understanding the need for advanced booking um, customers are able to book as i said through a phone line we also allow um, booking or they can send a message on facebook as well um, so lots of flexibility on how they can get in. Um, I would say it's been amazing for our engagement. So this is the initial post we put up in um, end of May announcing we were coming back to rhyme time and it reached over 33,000 people, which is really, really good numbers for us. Um, and we've had hundreds of comments and the comments are the best part because you see not only people saying they're excited to come back, sharing how much they love their sessions, people tagging each other and recommending, oh, this is the thing I told you about. Um, and we also sometimes get people coordinating to meet up at Bouncing Rhyme the next week through our comments. Um, so it's a really nice way to see people kind of uh, interacting and sharing, building community. We also list our sessions on our website and we have a local community directory. And the top um, queries about the community directory are about Bouncing Rhyme time, um, followed closely by Baby Way. Um, so it's definitely our target audience. We're also part of a collective with other partners. Um, so our uh, children's services, our health teams, they all share our bounce from one posts and signpost their families to us. And we do the same in return. Um, and we're also on the new 50 things to do before you're five, which we just launched in July. Um, so it's another way to kind of direct families to rhyme time. Um, so just quickly about impact. Um, obviously, we've had a load of amazing stories and I don't have time, so I've just picked out a few kind of themes that have been coming out. Um, the first one really is about families finding support, um, those who've been isolated during COVID, um, particularly people who are away from families. Um, we have a lot of people living in rural areas who struggle to get anywhere normally and it was made worse during COVID. 
um, and those who are first time parents and didn't have existing family or um, mum connections to kind of link into. Uh, we've also had several families who moved to Norfolk during the pandemic with new children and didn't know any of the local services or any local people. Um, so they've been coming to Bounce and Rhyme Time, not only for the group, but then asking for signposting or help getting in touch with local services. Um, so it's been really great opportunity for people there. We've also seen a lot in um, babies, particularly all the ones born during the pandemic who didn't get many experiences. And staff have been writing in to talk about how they've seen the baby and the adult's confidence grow week to week, where initially the child will be really uncertain and a bit afraid. And after two or three weeks, they're kind of excited to be coming in the door. They greet the staff and know who everyone is. And it's a really nice opportunity to see them kind of blossoming and connecting with other people. Um, we've also got over the summer, over the last month, we've seen families staying after the session and chatting with each other. So kind of sharing their experiences, um, sharing contact details with each other and like building their little networks, which is what we always used to have at Bounce and Rhyme. And it's been lovely to have back again. Um, and the group that was a surprise to me, but shouldn't have been, was our staff who've reported that they're feeling a lot happier to have Bounce and Rhyme back in libraries again. Um, the opportunity to have face-to-face -face contact with people, which everyone was a bit uncertain about, running Bounce and Rhyme every week has been a good way for them to get back into that and learn how relearn how to have the conversations with customers again after a year of kind of ushering people in and out as quick as possible um, and they also just feel happier to come to work and have the bounce and rhyme and something like a normal library service being in place again has been really good so real quick i just want to talk about our plans for the autumn we're going to keep adding more sessions to our libraries we have um, 32 of our 47 libraries are running a bounce and rhyme every week and we've got four more starting in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the rest are just waiting. We're doing some layout changes in our libraries and um, to reduce the one-way systems. And that will give us the space for groups again. Uh, we're gonna keep working to increase capacity in our branches because um, we do still have, most of our groups are fully booked every week, um, but we'll continue to kind of review the booking system and see how long we're gonna carry on with that. Um, hopefully we can go back to drop-ins again. And we're excited we're getting volunteers back in libraries. We've got one volunteer running sessions now, and we've got about three or four who are coming back in the next month and we're actively recruiting, which is a really nice thing to have because we've had some lovely volunteers. Um, and the last thing is just we're going to be live streaming um, some Bouncing Rhyme once a week, um, once a month. Uh, we did our first... on this one. Sorry, <laughs> I thought that was someone telling me to stop talking. Um, we've got a live stream. So we live streamed a Pride Bouncing Rhyme in July. Um, and it was an amazing kind of turnout. So we hope to do some more live streaming. Sorry. And my son's just noticed Hannah, who we went to Bouncing Rhyme this morning with. So he's excited to see her on the screen again. So that's all from Norfolk. Thank you guys very much for letting me come. <laughs> thank you beth that, that was brilliant so thank you and uh, and also to your toddler as well who's been joining in <laughs> there are quite a few questions in the chat so we'll come to those in the panel discussion and now i'm going to hand over to um to andrew and also to angela who are going to talk about their experiences okay thank you very much um can everyone hear me okay Good. Okay, thank you. Right, okay, well, my name is Andrew Orr, and I am Senior Librarian Literacy Development for Blackburn with Darwin Borough Council Libraries. Um, we um, were quite lucky in a way in that um, we had a pre existing risk assessment for. Um, rhyme times. Um, our healthy living department in the council actually ran a pilot rhyme time back in October 2020, just before the start of the second lockdown. So we were able to get that risk assessment out and uh, dust it off. Um, and then the middle of May, when uh, restrictions started to ease, um, Blackburn with Darwin Council actually had a programme linked to Five Ways to Wellbeing. And we introduced um, Story Rhyme Times as part of that programme. 
Um, so prior to um, libraries opening, um, the council official health and safety department had been around the buildings um, and given us um, guidance on the maximum numbers that would be permitted in each library and within the central library within each meeting room. So we knew kind of like the maximum limits that we could work with. Um, so we limited places on the sessions to make sure that we were within the um, guidance that they had said and that allowed us to make sure that social distancing and everything was adhered to. Um, we encouraged pre-booking to ensure uh, that the maximum numbers weren't breached and to avoid disappointment on the day because we felt that if people turned up and were told, well, actually, sorry, it's full, um, that was going to be a bit counterproductive. So we were sort of trying to manage expectations uh, as best we could. Um, we ensured before we started that all the windows in the, the rooms uh, were open to make sure that the ventilation uh, was okay and the furniture was all placed to make sure that the family bubbles were kept safely two metres apart. Um, at the beginning of the process, sort of middle of May, actually it was still council policy here that people had to wear a mask um, in the building, although once people were in the meeting room where we were running the rhyme time, um, the, the leader was able to sort of step back and say, right, I'm going to keep my distance and take the mask off and just take the mask off for the actual running of the session itself. Uh, we made sure plenty of hand sanitizer and wipes were available. Um, and when we first started, um, because we've got a, a Blackburn Central Library, is such a big building, we've got three floors, only uh, the ground floor was initially open. So to get to the meeting rooms on the first floor, people had to take the lift. So um, Angela was running the sessions um, in the room. I was on meet and greet down at the door and um, escorting um, people uh, in, in their bubbles, kind of like to the lift, a bubble at a time, and then um, wiping down the lift buttons with um, sanitizer um, after each time uh, before we let the next person in. As time went on and more of the library opened and the public were moving more freely around the building anyway, we decided that wasn't really necessary anymore. So we, um, we, we stopped doing that particular um, thing. In terms of the marketing, as I say, it was initially marketed as part of the Five Ways to Wellbeing programme. Um, to be perfectly honest, um, I put a post on social media and the inquiries just came flooding in. Um, I wish, I wish, I wish that all of our marketing was as easy as that. It's, it's not, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> but but this one was just obviously there was so much pent up demand for um, the service out there that um, we really, you, to get people in, we didn't have to work particularly hard. We had to work pretty hard once they were in, uh, but but just to get people across the threshold didn't, didn't seem to be particularly uh, difficult in the initial phases at all. So that's a little bit of the background. I'm now going to hand over to Angela because she um, did most of the actual running of the sessions. And then I'll just chip in a little bit at the end about um, plans for um, where we go from here. So over to Angela. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, in terms of delivery, when we began our sessions, we were still quarantining uh, stock as it came back from borrowers. Um, so it was very, very important once we realised that children within the session were going to want to handle the things that they'd seen me using at the front, that we'd keep those um, props and equipment out of reach of the children. So I uh, allocated a windowsill and I'd have all of my equipment just sat there um, waiting to be brought into the session and when it had been finished with I returned it there um, and, and that worked really well. Um, I also gave equipment out for children to handle just within their family bubble um, and that sort of also minimised 
the children's needs to be running out and handling the puppets that I've been using to engage um, children with the stories. Um, we were also not able to do singing when we first began um, as per government guidelines. So I was composing uh, rhymes and um, putting text on a screen so that the families and myself could speak together through the rhymes um, and that worked really really well in terms of feedback it was all positive we had lots of verbal feedback on the day and retrospectively uh, via email and phone calls um, as Andrew mentioned we had a high demand initially um, but I, I think in the feedback for me was shown by families returning to subsequent sessions and really scrambling to book their place at the very earliest opportunity. Um, families are giving verbal feedback on the day were um, expressing their concern about their own socialization, social isolation during lockdown and expressing concern for the children um, about the development and the opportunities that they'd missed by being um, spending lots of time at home so they were expressing their immense gratitude for an opportunity to come out uh, to be in an, an environment away from home and to be in the company of other children and families that were at their stage um, in their life journey um, we had a case, as Beth mentioned earlier, of a family that moved into the area that didn't know anyone at all and they'd spent much of the time in lockdown just together as a family and not having any uh, sights of any other people. So for them to come to a session, meet another family was just life changing and um, she said that the, the mum of that family uh, said to me that she was able to then go on to meet with the parents that she'd met in the session and have walks in the park. So the rhyme time for her was an absolute lifeline and she was so, so grateful for that opportunity. The challenges for myself um, came from the family's enthusiasm, which seems like an odd thing to say. However, um, they were so carried away in the moment that it was very difficult at times for them to remember social distancing. And I'm um, speaking not just about children, but adults too. Um, so to sort of overcome that challenge, it was necessary at times to just give very, very subtle, polite reminders that we needed to just to be a little bit distant from the other children in the session. I'm going to hand back over to Andrew now to finish off. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so really, um, just to, to, to wrap up a little bit in terms of plans, um, we normally um, historically have actually stopped doing the round time sessions during the summer so that we can focus on the um, older children during the school holidays and then we get things um, going again with the storing the round times in the autumn so that's 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 the plan um, we'll keep an eye on the official guidance and gradually um, reduce um, restrictions as we're allowed to um, one thing we did find um, particularly towards the end of the summer was that we were getting quite a lot of no shows. People were sort of booking weeks and weeks and weeks in advance and then not actually either able or remembering to turn up on the day, which was a little bit frustrating. So we're going to just take bookings up to uh, October half term and then, you know, review it, see where we go from there. We, you know, we may not need to stick with the booking system after that. We'll, 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 we'll just have to um see really how we go with that one in terms of partners um we have um obviously um had some involvement with the um health and well-being team who sort of got the ball rolling with the five ways to well-being we've also been exploring partnerships with um speech and language therapists they attended a couple of our uh, events over the summer um, and we're keen to sort of see if we can maybe get them dropping into the library um, maybe once a month on an ongoing basis um, to talk to 
parents address any concerns they may have um, either in the session or just in the library itself. And I think that's it from us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. And uh, also, Andrew, that I think that was really, really helpful from perspective um, on how you were running your sessions, but some similarities too. I'm going to hand over to Louise now, who's going to talk about her experiences in Cambridgeshire. Hello, I'm Louise. Yes, I'm the Children and Young People's Library Development Officer for Cambridgeshire. Um, Cambridgeshire opened up for managed browsing uh, the week beginning the 12th of April. So we were right in there straight away. And, and even though our libraries were um, had very reduced opening hours and quite frankly resembled a closing down sale, people did still come back, um, just not the families. And basically, I think for all of us, they are our lifeblood. So um, we piloted three sessions where we got families together um, at the end of April, beginning of May, we were very brave, um, actually in my area, which is East Cams in Fenland, where we had an existing DFE opportunity area funded project, which is all about encouraging families to engage with their libraries, families with naught to fours. So it seemed most uh, a good fit. Um, these were successful. So we used the safety measures I had to put in place and fed in the learning from the sessions to our planning to reinstate weekly rhyme times in our hub libraries, our biggest libraries, um, across the county, week beginning the 17th of May. So the first moment we were allowed to, and I think there's seven libraries were involved, um, probably ended up with about 14 sessions a week. So all our events were held in closed sessions to begin with at that time. They were run by staff because um, they're in the hub libraries. We had staff. Um, we used an existing risk assessment that we'd actually put together for partners who were using the building during closed um, close to the public time. So that was a really good starting point. I hate starting from scratch. Um, so we put in uh, place certain measures. We measured out a three metre circumference around each. Actually, we had a pair of chairs um, in case a, a two, two adults came with the family to, just to see what our capacity was. It was terrifying. Um, we soon realised just how that two metre circumference just reduces even the largest spaces capacity. Um, reinforced our decision to go ahead in our biggest libraries and on closed days. We asked adults and children to sanitise. We um, asked them to respect the one-way systems we had in place, wear masks, keep two metres apart at all times. The leader wore a mask before and after delivering the event, but they actually had a visor on when they were actually delivering and they kept the two metres away. Um, and of course, we had the natural, uh, the, the legal limitation of only having five adults attending, obviously six with the leader. We had, we had our toilets open, but we had wipes there um, and we didn't use props. Uh, but they were allowed to look at the books um, and we didn't, um, we didn't quarantine them when they'd looked at them. So um, that, that was rather nice, made it for a much more relaxing session. We used Eventbrite for booking. We had only online bookings. Uh, there was no queues at the desk. There were no drop-ins drop on the day. It helped us keep to our five adult rule for singing. Some libraries did opt to do just a, a, a story time so they could have a few more. But again, we were defeated by the amount of space it took up, um, even in a closed session. I think our central library just about found room for, for nine. Um, so in the libraries where we expected high demand, and as we went on, we realised there was high demand, we, we doubled up the sessions. So um, it stuck to their one day a week, but we had some libraries where they had simultaneous rhyme times, which sounded a bit like a round at times, um, and, and very far, some in the meeting room, some in the main body of the library. We had consecutive ones with 30 minutes in between to hose everything down and make everything to sanitise. Or if we were lucky and we had a whole closed day, we'd have one in the morning, one in the afternoon. It all depended on staffing and uh, capacity. So that was our, our kind of model when we kicked off in May. We marketed through, um, we designed some posters announcing Rhyme Time is back with a big exclamation mark. 
we didn't have many other places to put them because no buildings were taking posters and actually the library were one of the few buildings in the community that actually opened to the public so we um we were kind of a bit in-house there but um excuse me <coughs> The end of lockdown one we'd actually persuaded our comms that we needed another facebook page just for families so we've got our facebook families page um, we've always fed the children family centers um social media and and we've always um sent things to, to local platforms that the staff knew of so everything went out to those the family workers took it out when they were working one-to-one -one with their families and recommended it we knew families so there was word of mouth. We told some families, they told their groups and uh, kind of concentric circles out from there. And what we didn't expect was that Eventbrite itself would actually bring in a new audience. There were young families actively looking for things to do locally, especially if they were free. So, um, so we had sort of unexpected marketing. The feedback, as I think everybody else has said, was kind of overwhelmingly positive. Um, parents were delighted to bring their babies out. And mostly we did get a high proportion of babies. They were ones that were, I think will ever be known as lockdown babies. That's when they were born. They were so pleased to find something that was safe and free and live. Um, they had no reservations about entering the building. We had wondered, they, they didn't mind wearing masks. They, well, basically we could have asked them to do a handstand. I think they would have done it just so that they could come in and be sociable. They were happy to be sociable. They were even more happy for their babies to socialize. Uh, we had worried that mums, these were new mums, these were lockdown mums, would be a bit precious if other babies approached their babies, but no, and I'm afraid we did let the babies mingle. So they were crawling up to each other. We were crawling on each other. Um, it was delightful. I don't know if it was legal, but it was delightful. Um, and they loved the fact that they could actually browse at a leisurely pace managed browsing it's very managed with one-way systems it it's it doesn't libraries are renowned for serendipity it didn't really encourage that so <coughs> excuse me they had a bit more time so the impact um on the library i would say they started to come to life they've done so even more with the summer reading challenge but this was the start we did have more families coming through the doors when the libraries were open because they'd seen what the library was like, they knew it was safe, they knew it was somewhere that had something to offer them, so they'd come in when we were open. We took all the chairs away to begin with, but then, then they just came in the children's library and just lay on the floor. So, I mean, you know, it was lovely. Word got round that the library was a destination, if, you know, even if you couldn't linger too long, unless you wanted to lie on the floor, um, and it had free books in it, which people seem to have forgotten. Um, we in, reinstated our incentive scheme. I will confess, we're still using the Bookstart Bear Club. I have nearly a thousand certificate ones, so we're just going to keep going. Um, but like a uh, previous colleague, um, our surprise was the staff. They felt re-energised. This was a piece of pre-COVID normalcy. In spite of all the restrictions around it, it's something they remember from doing before they rethought the sessions um they admitted they got a bit complacent before lockdown about plugging membership promoting the resources i'm ashamed to say this but they they did confess so they've thought much harder about how they present it and how they remind people that this isn't just an event the whole library experience is an event um and some of my libraries have actually kept going with rhyme times through summer holidays and this has never happened all the time i've been here they just couldn't bear to stop now they've built a following we did have challenges um eventbrite is not ideal it's free it's easy to set up it's easy to use but what we needed was a, a waiting system that would automatically put another person forward because we did put all our dates up to begin with on the site and so people gaily booked themselves in and then got a better offer so they then cancelled if we were lucky um but we it, it was too clunky to get people to replace um and they were the parents that cancelled we had quite a number of parents that didn't cancel um they just they just didn't turn up on the day so that was a shame we i think we've wiggled that one out now people have got over the excitement of going to the ball pool now and um they've come back to the library um 
to begin with, it was the restrictions on the numbers allowed to sing. I mean, you know, five was just farcical. And if, 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 if two parents came together, that knocks back the amount of families we could have. It's now the numbers of libraries allowed in, a uh, number of people allowed in our libraries. Um, going forward, we want to introduce like, you know, rhyme times as they were in practically all of our libraries, but we've got some very small ones. Um, and with the social distancing and the very small business ca uh, building capacities, it, it really is, that's just what's holding us back. Um, the other thing is we have single staff libraries and they've gone back to single staff. They were dual staff when we had to kind of shepherd people. Uh, their, their rhyme times were, were delivered by volunteers. The volunteers are coming back slowly, but a lot of them haven't come back. But um, we are ditching where we want to Eventbrite. We are now more and more of my libraries are having, um, they're going back to drop-ins, first come first served, which is delightful. People are being very understanding if the capacity is reached. Um, and we're doing rhyme times in open sessions, which as you all know, is so much better because we want it to feel part of the whole um, library experience. And it's nice for other people to see things going on. It, as I say, it's brought our libraries back to life and um, we're really pleased to have them and we're gonna work very hard to get them back everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Oh, thank you to all our speakers, our presenters, because um, that was really, really interesting. And uh, I really love the fact, Louise, that you talked about how Rhyme Times really re-energised -energ your staff. Um, I'm, I'm going to pass over to Sarah now, and she's going to say a little bit about uh, building parental confidence. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. I hope you can all see that. So um, I really should be right, should be uh, handing over to my colleagues from Essex. I see some colleagues from Essex Libraries are here today, um, and some of those were involved in this project. But it, we just thought it might be worth just reminding you about this project from that was done with Shared Intelligence back in oh, 2017, 2018. Uh, that was about maternal mental health and the role of rhyme times in supporting maternal mental health because at the end of the project eight, there were 18 recommendations about just making your rhyme times really welcoming and we thought it, this is probably a good time to remind people about those. So just to quickly whiz through the project, it was about, it was from Shared Intelligence, and if any of you know Ben Lee from Shared Intelligence, he's very persuasive and he asked us if we would participate with him in a piece of research to look at whether rhyme times could support maternal mental health and positive maternal mental health. The, uh, we went through a, a quite a, a year long program of, of testing that with various measures in place. And what we found was that the self reported mood of mothers was higher immediately after the sessions compared to before. And we just measured that through a sort of before and after mood chart. Um, and found that just mood went up because of the sessions, because of the opportunity to sing and be with other people. And why that, why the mood went up, these are some of the things that they said to us. And we used focus groups and various questionnaires to discover what parents thought about rhyme times, particularly mothers. And they said that having a rhyme time session to go to helped structure the day. So it was really important that there was something they would aim at during the day. And anyone with a new baby knows how difficult it is just to get out of the house. So actually having a structure um, that, and somewhere very easy to get to increase that sort of sense of control and also gave something to look forward to. It was also important to have a clear structure to the sessions because that made people feel, feel secure as well. They knew what to expect when they got to the sessions and they knew what would happen and exactly when it would happen. It was very reassuring, especially if you were a new parent or, or worried about coming into the space. So it was all about reducing anxiety and increasing confidence. It gave them confidence as a parent well, one of the things parents reported was when they saw their child doing something, they knew that their child was in line roughly with the other children. They weren't, they, it was, it reduced worry about where their child was developmentally. And it also gave them a sense of pride when they saw their child joining in for the first time or clapping along. And um, it definitely reduced isolation and stress and gave people respite. They, they said that even when they knew rhyme time was coming up, they felt calmer. And it gave them a sense of achievement. So just getting out of the house 
to go to Ryan's time just gave them a sense of, I've managed to do that today. So the recommendations that came out of that research, I, I just picked out some of them that I thought were particularly relevant for now. And one of them is about the importance of the welcome. People really valued being welcomed if you, if you knew their names that, or, or just knew the child's name, that they just sort of felt welcomed and encouraged. Um, it was, it's important to just look out for anyone who's perhaps on the, on the edge of the group or who's hanging back a bit nervous, just to make sure they feel welcome, especially if they're new. And during the session, one of the big things, and it was a, a really important piece of learning for me was, just the importance of thanking people for getting to the rhyme times and congratulating them for getting there. Um, and then just being really reassuring about it doesn't matter if you don't know the word, if the child cries. So it's just all those things about making parents feel comfortable, encouraging everyone to learn the songs and sing along and particularly sing them at home as well. Um, explain to them, we, we did quite a lot of work when we were doing this project around adult, to child, adult and child interaction. And the fact that you get a mood boost from that sort of face to face looking at your child, the gaze between parent and child is, is about stimulating that oxytocin hormone and making everyone feel a lot happier. So it's good to explain that to parents that it's that, that sort of face to face gazing into the child's eyes gives you both a mood boost. And uh, as I said before, they really value the kind of the, the structure to the session. So having the same welcome song, having the same goodbye finishing song just gives that indication of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and know exactly where they are in the rhyme time. And I said, encouraging adults to sing at home. So I'll just stop sharing. So that's very, very quick. You can read the whole report if you haven't read it on uh, the Shared Intelligence website. We can put the link in the chat at the end or send the chat out perhaps with the, with the uh, recording so that you've got that if you want it, so send the link out. So um, that's, that's all about the, the maternal mental health research. So we're really going to go now into the uh, discussion. And I, I've just, I've been overwhelmed. I've been trying to kind of catch up with all the actual, uh, actual questions that are coming in. So uh, <laughs> I'll do my best to, to pick up some of them. And if, if not, then I think what we'll do is obviously share them. But I know you've been sharing responses to each other as well as we're going through. I did just want to say, Beth, it's lovely to have an actual rhyme time uh, customer in the room it's really lovely and I also wanted to say what an inspired idea to put four books out to actually demarcate spaces which is a brilliant idea for, for getting into off as well and all, to all of you just to say thank you because all of you have brilliant ideas for making the welcome so much richer when people come back so um, I thought that the, um, the questions I had I, there was a, a whole load of questions around live streaming which we might pick up if we've got time also about sharing toys use of masks about booking systems and what to do if people do just turn up about rhyme times outdoors and what we do about no shows i think so i i was, but I was going to start i think it's sarah from barbican library who's been talking about the fact that you've been doing lots of rhyme times outdoors sarah would you be willing to just unmute and tell us a bit about your outdoor rhyme times uh, yep yeah. hi everybody um Thank you. nice to see you all um we as soon as the weather got good enough um so we weren't absolutely freezing and the children weren't freezing we 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 set up rhyme times in um we're lucky in the city of london to have lots of spaces that we can use so we've done um two churchyards or gardens in churches and one um one just one one city garden um and we 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 asked for if they could use we could use the space and our colleagues in open spaces said yes so pretty much we started the next week we we um, we have mailing lists. We put it on on Facebook and and Twitter. Told people that we were going to be there. And as as everybody else has said, it's kind of word of mouth more than anything. Um, people just got to know that we were doing the rhyme times. Um, and you know, okay, so at Barbican Library, we would pre-COVID, we would be having forty people, forty children, so we're eighty eighty people in effect in the room for rhyme time, and we were pulling about. 10 families um, for the outdoor rhyme times throughout the summer so it was quite reduced but um, it was still good we would get there we would um, take something so um, we've got mats so we would take mats and, and space them out so we made sure everybody was spaced out um, risk assessments obviously had to be done face masks worn um, except for when you were and because we were outside and we could space ourselves out and stand back 
we, we were singing. We were singing from May onwards because we could um, we could stand back and we wasn't so worried about being inside and and what was the word that we used? Was it aerosol spray or some? I can't remember what the phrase was. There was some weird phrase, wasn't there, about when you sing and spit, basically, mm. is what they were talking about. Um, <laughs> so, and, and everyone was really pleased. The parents were really, really pleased. And to begin with, most of them were saying, thank you very much. We don't feel comfortable and safe being inside, but we really wanted rhyme time and it's nice to be out here and doing it. And now for... Um, my colleague Sonna is somewhere here um, and she might might tell me differently. But I think for the last probably the last month, the last two, two to four weeks, people have been starting to say, actually, it's getting a bit colder and we feel a bit more safe. And we've been coming into the library because, as everybody else, our libraries were closed and then they were open for restricted browsing. And, and now we're open fully our full hours. And um, now people are saying actually what we really want is to be inside the library doing rhyme time inside the library with other colleagues um with, with others with other children so we are we are thinking hopefully by the end of september um we're planning to have rhyme times back in all three we've only got three libraries because we are a very small city of london so um we were hoping to have all three libraries doing rhyme times again inside thank you sarah thanks for sharing okay. um, Christina from Somerset. Christina, your earliest question um, I saw in the comments was about masks and keeping staff safe during the rhyme time. Do you just want to unmute and just ask a question and perhaps the panel can just give their responses to that? Yep, that's fine. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, so my question was, even though masks aren't required, a lot of our staff are still preferring to use masks, um, both for themselves and for the others. Because I know the first speaker was talking about like the P's and T's and not necessarily being able to see and like that being a barrier to communication. Does anybody have any suggestions or ideas or tips if people are still wanting to use masks, how they can best communicate or what alternatives there might be? That's it. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. So any of you that want to respond to that? Well, I might just pick on you otherwise. <laughs> I, I I'll, think Louise, I'll have a go. Oh, sorry, Sue. Go on. After um, you. I, was, I was just going to say, did Louise mention about some of the staff wearing visors? Yes. I mean, I, I think that was the thing. If, if they were wandering around and um, being with people uh, before the rhymes or story time, they would wear their masks. They would sit down at the socially distanced space at the front and they would take their masks off. But they would have a clear visor. So at least that some of that aerosol wasn't getting as far. I mean, we know they're not ideal but from a distance because we needed the children to see the face especially if you're doing rhymes or stories it's just so important i actually had a local author in as well for some of my initial three sessions um and and she was all visored up and it made all the difference when she was um, and she had a story on a screen behind her which was another really um good way of getting around that the family's not being able to be that close mm. But the visors were, were wonderful. Just get the right one because they could be so uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Angela, did you... Um, just to underscore the uh, importance of children being able to see your lips moving um, as, as you say the words. Um, so for that very reason, um, I took my mask off to present um, during the session and just maintained a very very strict social distance and if any child um, needed to be approached for any reason then I'd just say oh, I'm just going to pop my mask on do this and then we'll take it back off to speak with you and to sing again. Thank you. Liz do you have any reflections on that? No I think we, we, we've got to just find solutions that work and some people are comfortable with um, not wearing masks and doing the social distancing and others with the visors. Um, yeah, I think we, we, we've just got to do what we can really. Um, but mm -hmm. obviously the more, more the children can see your mouth moving, um, then, then the better their, their language development will be. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's, it, it definitely seems to be something about, you know, staff confidence and how we can make the staff feel as confident as possible so that, you know, the, the customers get the best possible experience isn't it so it's, it's kind of 
Yes, and there are those, yeah, those masks that have got the clear bits as well, aren't they? So um, one of the other things that I, I had questioned about was, um, I think Clara was asking about uh, Norfolk Libraries and a separate Facebook page for Rhyme Times. Um, Beth, is, is, that, is that the case in Norfolk? I know that Louise talked about that as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, we set up a separate um, Facebook page for our families back in June last year. Um, it's something we tried about three or four years ago and couldn't really get the take up. We didn't have enough content. Um, but as we were doing the story times twice a week, we were doing bouncing rhyme time every week. Um, and there was lots of information from partners to share. We relaunched it last June um, and it's been really good. Uh, so we had 100 people when we first joined who were all staff. Who knew about it from a few years ago and i think we've just passed 2000 now have wow. are following the page um, and lots of local groups like mumbler um, or get me out of the four walls which is a local um, mental health charity for new parents will share our posts from it so that's how we're building more audience and it helps so much because there was so much online content in the last year and it gets a bit lost. And so having a family's page has really, really worked well for us. Um, yeah, and I think Louise, you said you've set one up too now. We you? did, um, for exactly the same reason. Uh, we were getting more and more events. We did a whole you know, summer where we did the summer reading challenge events online because we had to last year. Yeah. Um, things were getting, you know what Facebook's like, as soon as you've posted it and then somebody else posts out, it's, it's gone. So we, we, it took, it was like pulling teeth to get one out of our comms. Um, I don't know if from our comms is on this call. We, um, it was so difficult, but in the end, because of the project I mentioned at the beginning of my piece, you know, with, with government money, they, that, that actually gave us the leverage to get what, a, a Facebook family, um, Facebook for families page. And, and it has made a huge difference. We've had to work hard to make sure it's, um, out there because we trained everybody to look at the main one um but but we're getting numbers like yours we're very proud we're, we're getting numbers like yours now which um it's, it's brilliant interesting I, I hear some people have library facebook pages and i'm very jealous <laughs> um just yeah, we, on we have family we have branch pages in addition to families as well so we've got oodles oodles of facebook pages <laughs> Just on uh, what we're talking about, um, Facebook reminds me, um, during lockdown, to get around some of the publisher restrictions we made, um, not get around, but to comply with the publisher restrictions, we created a Facebook group, which you can do on Facebook, which means that um, when you post, only people who are part of your group can, can see that. So that is... Uh, uh, another option as well. I have to say, at the moment, it's it's kind of resting really, but um, that's something we we may put some more content on uh, uh, again. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Gillian Sage, um, you you asked a question about. I think it was to I think it was well, um, to Angela and and Andrew, or possibly Beth, about how sessions were structured. Do you just want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, hi everybody. Um, it wasn't so much a question, it was just more, sh just a general sharing of how everybody does their rhyme times, really. Um, you know, do you give, so in Market Deeping, we're a community library. Um, uh, we like to give sheets uh, of the rhymes for parents to take home so they can sing them at home. Um, and I just, wondered if it would be good to share some ideas about how we actually structure and run our rhyme times because we're probably all doing it slightly differently yeah so, we're um, doing it differently oh, sorry. The whole county <laughs> <laughs> sorry angela um so i i read a story mm -hmm. i do a counting uh, song with um, a felt board so that the numbers and uh, items are visible for the children to make those connections um, and I do a, mu a music and movement uh, section where uh, we just um, play a song and we move along to that um, did I say read a story and um, and then 
something um, extra, like a little game, like uh, Simon says, or I spy or something along that line. And that, that uh, we spoke earlier about um, knowing what's coming next and that sort of structure happens in different ways, but that following that sort of order each week. I don't think we're as adventurous as you. <laughs> we tend to, some of them they do read a story, um, but we were getting so many babies that it was very much um, rhymes and rhymes for babies. So it really is. Um, I was really interested in Sarah. I was going down Sarah's checklist of the, what you shared. We do all those things in our checkpoint. Sure. So basically it's welcoming. It is noticing people that are new. And of course, to begin with, all of them were new um, or they felt new. Um, and then we have a, a rhyme order and we always have in Fen and East Cams, we always start with the wheels on the bus and we end with twinkle twinkle in other places they have hello songs and goodbye songs and but we do top and tail but it is a pretty uh, pure rhyme time um, and because we had predominantly babies um, it, it became very pure baby rhyme time but where they did the story times yeah we picked quite short stories very very interactive these children were learning how to concentrate in a in, in a group which they weren't terribly used to doing or out of practice so it was very very simple and then there was very much the and now you can look at the 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 books and you know talking to them and that somebody mentioned talking you know parents talking about their experience so we did a bit of socially distanced um how's it going how old's your baby all those nice questions that make them feel a bit more special and get to to talk um yeah it was very simple but it's what people seem to want really it sounds like the sort of thing where we where actually we could do a quick kind of almost like a maybe Chris through Esco a kind of quick survey of the different ways in which rhyme time is structured and then we could send it out as a I don't know diff, you know kind of 100 ways to structure your rhyme time session yeah. so just, just to, to share good practices I mean even just listening to, to the three of you there's been some brilliant ideas yeah. and I think Beth, the uh, first thing Sarah is that certainly in Gateshead our rhyme times are very much determined by whoever is presenting the rhyme time. Mm. So some presenters are much more lively and louder and that is the way they present and, and families go to the rhyme time because that is what they like. Other presenters are more gentle, more measured. And again, it's a bit of a pick and choose. The parents can choose a rhyme mm. time that suits them and their child the best, really. So I believe it is good to have variety yeah that's really really good good point isn't it and yeah and parents do 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 some parents do like the sort of much quieter rhymes don't they and so they feel more secure there thank you beth i've just got some a couple of people have asked about your live streaming plans would you be able to just tell us a little tiny bit more about those yeah of course um so i did know there was one question um earlier a bit about the copyright and the uh, I think photo permissions as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with copyright, we try to stick with um, songs that are in public domain um, as much as possible. Um, it's not 100% because I just send to the person who's running the session and say, these are the songs you should stick with. But sometimes they, they just lapse into the ones they're used to singing with people anyway. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, we do as part of our booking system, actually, uh, we ask people if they are giving photo permissions as part of the booking. Um, we don't generally take photos, but it's just kind of good to be in the habit of it. Um, and if we're going to do a film session, we'll say specifically, this is going to be filmed. If you attend, you have to consent to being on camera. Yeah. Um, the last time we did the live streaming, we had two cameras set up. Um, one was on a phone that was live streaming onto Facebook. And the other one we were recording on some higher quality um, recording equipment. And that one we put onto YouTube. Um, the one for YouTube was just trained on the person um, who was presenting. So there were no children in the shot. The one on Facebook um, at a couple points, like when we were doing Grand Old Duke of York um, or Sleeping Bunnies, they did kind of pan around just because it was really nice to be able to see everyone getting up and down and moving and engaging. Um, but because everyone had given consent, that was mm. acceptable to do. Um, and we would only run the rhyme times um, either where we've got permission from everybody 
or we would train it just on the person there and tell everyone to stay out of camera shot um, that we're filming the session. Um, so that's over handing the publisher um, the permissions in terms of children. Um, I don't know if there was a third question that popped up about the live streaming. I can't remember those are the two that I or if that covers it picked up. So okay. um, but we can we can sort of go through the, the questions of uh, it, it's cool, literally a 14 minute of film. Now it's now it's literally for quarter past three. So uh, I need to draw this session to a close just to say thank you for all your questions. Some amazing questions and thank you also for all the answers that you've put in the chat as well. I always think one of the best things about these webinars is how everyone feeds feeds answers to each other. So um, we'll, we'll try and save the chat as well so that you can you can see that afterwards and can share that too. But I'm just going to hand you over now to Chris. So just to reiterate what Sarah said there, thank you everyone for your contribution today. I think we've shared a lot and we've learned a lot. Um, some excellent questions in the chat and some excellent answers from the panel. A couple of little sentences that I've picked up on that I really liked. I think it was from Louise who said, Rhyme Time is a whole library experience. And I really love that because that is the importance of Rhyme Time, isn't it? It's the introduction of them to the wider library experience. And I loved Liz's comment that the village is more important than it has ever been. And if you believe that we are the village, or certainly part of the village, we have an absolute key role into contributing to the recovery. Um, we know how important rhyme time is and we know how much it is valued. So good luck to everyone um, as you restart your activities. Thank you to all of our guests. It's been a very entertaining and informative afternoon. Um, the webinar will be available to revisit on YouTube. So please share with all your colleagues who haven't had the chance to come along today. Um, I think we can all learn something. I've certainly got a whole page of, of notes of things that have good ideas that we can steal or share, which is, is what this network is all about, really. Um, so thank you again for everyone for attending, and we hope to see you all again soon. And good luck with your rhyme times. <laughs>